it's quite a, a memorable occasion for us to have you here as um, possibly the first public event uh, on our campus since we had our inaugural pro professorial lecture from Professor Janet Stevenson. Um, we're very much appreciative of you taking the time uh, to journey out of your uh, safe zone in Wellington to come down here. We are aware of the risks that are involved should we go into lockdown and should you have to navigate your way back through uh, to Wellington, but we're confident that the public health advice that we have in New Zealand I shall remind you that is largely guided by experts from the University of Otago, that that public health advice will, um, will see that we will not need to, to um, hold you here any longer than you need to be here. Oh, and by the way, uh, to Manahiri Kite uh, Internet, uh, to those that are uh, on the internet by Zoom, uh, know my heart and my welcome to you all as well. Um, I think we're all here to hear you talk about the EU uh, Green Deal, and I just wanted to emphasise that we're very excited that we are, are able to contribute as we can uh, through uh, the leadership of the European Union in understanding what we need to do to secure this place, um, our planet, for not only our futures, but the futures of our, our children and their children and their children's children. And I'd, I'd like to emphasize in my role as DVC Research, we're also very, very pleased to see the Horizons Europe research funding coming out with $95 billion, 35% of which shall be devoted to climate research. And we're really, really encouraged that for the first time, our government is taking seriously the prospect of becoming partners in that uh, that it's, um, it, it's then the reality of us acting as a global community to, uh, to address real global problems is right in front of us. We are, we are smaller in number than other places, but we, we have equal ability to contribute. And we also will be able to contribute from unique perspectives of where we are, what knowledge we have to share, and what, um, what the issues are from this side of the planet that actually many of which will affect um, Europe and vice versa. So we're very much looking forward to hearing what you have to say tonight and contributing more uh, meaningfully in the future. I'd la now like to pass on, on to Associate Professor Ivan Dethraini, who will introduce you um, with a little bit more detail. So um, welcome, welcome, and thrice welcome. Kia ora. Uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, I'd like to start off with a few thank yous. Uh, also, thank you to Sebastian. Um, Caroline is here today, thanks to Sebastian and, and his great networking. So thanks, Seb. Um, just, uh, you know, today uh, in the news, I think China has announced uh, that it's not going to be funding any more uh, coal power plants uh, internationally. Uh, we have had President Biden um, talking about uh, climate change at the UN General Assembly. So there is really, this is really an opportune moment to, to talk about the EU uh, Green Deal. Um, and in the current sort of momentum that this uh, is uh, building, it's sort of easy to forget where the leadership has been on this issue. And as a proud European, I'm proud to say uh, that it has come from Europe. You know, Europe has led in this area for, for 20 years. Um, Things like the EU ETS uh, get, get a lot of profile, but there's a lot of you know, directives on, on building standards, on product uh, energy efficiency that have made a huge difference. And then many people don't really understand the extent to which uh, they have made a, a, a difference. So over uh, you know, two decades, the EU has definitely been leading the way in this in this space, uh, more recently around you know financial disclosures of climate risk uh, by financial institutions. So we have the EU taxonomy, which is being built and is becoming the standard globally. Um, and so the EU Green Deal is the next step, and uh, you know, we look forward very much to, to hearing what you have to say about it. About it. Uh, by way of introducing to you, uh, Caroline, uh, so you have twenty years of experience uh, at uh, largely at the EU Commission uh, across a, 
a fascinating range of, of DGs. So DG Energy, DG Climate, DG Budget. Uh, so, you know, a real yeah, EU insider. So it's a real pleasure to have you here. Uh, I've also, you were, you know, your head of trade uh, for um, the EU delegation here in Aotearoa, um, and you were in, in Australia before that. So, um, you know, you can talk broadly around the EU Green Deal, but you really have from the climate and energy uh, finance perspective, you have that blend of skills of finance and and um, and energy and climate that we're going to make the most of, not just tonight, but over the day tomorrow. So welcome. Thank you very much for coming. And we look forward greatly to your talk. Um, I'd like to start by this. Time is out of joint. All cursed spite that I was ever born to set it right. This is a post-Brexit celebration of British culture, a quote from Hamlet. And I think it sets the right tone about why we're here, but unites us tonight. Here um, on planet Earth in the Anthropocene, you are going to hear about what the European Union wants to do to tackle the greatest threat to humanity. Yet I am here talking to you in Otepoti because it could all be in vain. Our generation finally has to take responsibility across borders, across cultures, across religions, across tense trade relations, across tense geopolitical tensions. And um, so as you listen to what the EU does, I would uh, encourage you to not only ponder about what we do, but also feel, because this could be a way for us to take back control of our destiny if others were following suit or copying us or doing something different, but acting. So what is uh, who we are first? We are 27 member states, 450 million people who have been living in peace for 70 years after a millennia of uh, wars ravaged, ravaging the, the continent. So it's a, it's a good place to start with, uh, but really our next frontier is to become, let me see how I, is to become as part of the European Green Deal, the first climate neutral continent. It is the next frontier. It is our leadership's priority. So the stakes are very high, not only for the planet, but also politically for the current leadership. It is a test for the European Union as a project as well, because we're a project of peace, but also of prosperity and of solidarity inside and outside the European Union. It is a test of our influence beyond our borders. We know that economically we will weigh less and less, but it doesn't mean that we can't influence still more and more. And that is also what we're trying to do with the Green Deal. A bit of science, con science contest. We've had the last um, IPCC report early August and the three key words were it's unequivocal. Um, we, uh, men and women, homo sapiens is doing this climate change, it's unprecedented. We have not lived through uh, these times of changes, climate change before as homo sapiens, and it's uh, irreversible, but it's not too late. So we can't go back to the type of climate which we would feel is um, comfortable, familiar. So we're all migrants on planet Earth already from feeling at ease with the climate around us, but we can still avoid the worst effects. And the message to policymakers was urgent policy action is a time bound existential imperative. Delay is the same as failure. And as politicians, you are the last ones to be able to act in time. So that was the science, that is the science framing for our policymakers on climate action. And we are speaking truth to power when we are explaining this in, in simple words. And um, it's what the European Commission is telling now to all. 27 governments and parliament and the parliamentarians. What are the consequences for climate policy design? Well, it, it depends first on your risk appetite. And, and that's on the right-hand side. 
um, we have a certain carbon budget that we can still emit while staying below 1.5 degrees temperature rise, which is, which is the temperature at which the worst effects of climate change can be avoided. If you are a risk taker and you're happy with a one in two chance of staying one under 1.5 degrees, then at current emissions level, we had in 2020 about a, a decade, or we still have a decade now. If you're more risk adverse and you would be happier with an over 80% chance of seeing against uh, below 1.5 degree, then we at this stage have six years left at current emissions level. And if you look on the left hand side, you have the type of curve that respects the remaining carbon budget. We are in 2021 and we still emit around 40 billion tons. So that positions at, at the top at the top of the graph. So the type of emissions reduction curve that we need to engage on, as you can see, is the type of curve only experienced skiers would adventure themselves on. But we, that's the type of uh, slope for our emissions reductions that we need to follow to stay within our budget and to keep our Paris Agreement promise. So what does it say to policymakers? Well, it says, this requires unprecedented policy mixes. And you need as policymakers to make come up to provoke accelerated civilizational change. So it's not business as usual kind of uh, incremental change that you need to bring about. It's not something that only a carbon price can bring about. It's, it's a lot more than that. That is the, uh, now the international context, and I will start by the video because uh, it's in French, but it's very short, don't worry. Where, so what am I doing wrong? I must be doing something wrong, oh, never mind. Uh, double click, nope. No, that brings this, but not that, never mind. He was basically saying, et le l'accord de Paris est adopté. <laughs> which translate into what well, you probably all understood, but there was all the cheering and the emotions and the 20, more than 20 years of negotiations and people really feeling, ah, oh, we made it, it's the first global universal agreement. And um, we, we made it, or at least we agreed on the goal and the system. But so, so what's the goal? It's the, to pursue efforts to limit it, to limit a temperature rise to 1.5 degree, and we should not really talk about two degrees because that's not, that's not the deal with developing countries. The deal is to pursue efforts to 1.5 degrees. The, uh, we uh, also all committed, New Zealand, Europe, and 195 others, to uh, make nationally determined contributions every five years. Basically, these are pledges of emissions reduction that targets. Every five years, we need to increase them in line with science. And so, because we don't want it to be all talk and no walk, we need to have also to table domestic policy measures to reach these targets. So five years ago, uh, no, six years ago, we, we were supposed to do all that by last year, COVID derailed plan. And we all had one extra year to present an upgraded NDC and domestic policy measures. The European Union on the 14th of July, a revolutionary date if there was one, she's a French woman. The EU tabled its policy package to meet the next legal goalpost on its way to net zero, that is to reduce our emissions by 55% by 2030 compared to 1990. It is so far not only the most ambitious climate policy package tabled, it's still not enough, I have to say that it would be probably better if we could do minus 60 percent, minus 65 percent, but it is compared to others the most ambitious policy uh, target and policy and the only upgraded uh, NDC that was accompanied with domestic policy measures ahead of Paris. So the framing of the 14th of July package was um, climate stands alone in its existential consequences. Leaders now have one or two political cycles to um, legislate, to reach uh, net zero, to decrease emissions in time in this critical decade, and you're the last ones to be able to do it. In doing that, you have to leave no one behind because the transition needs to be so quick that it will be disruptive. And there will be some that, we, that may be left behind and that need to be helped to transition. 
Otherwise, there could be social unrest and undermining of the, of the whole uh, support for climate action. So this requires an all of government mission led action to with strong redistributive mechanisms so that people can adapt. Not adapt to climate change, sorry, adapt, adapt to reducing emissions quickly. And then the EU will lead. Yes, we are going ahead in front of everyone. And that has that entails some risks also economically in particular. But we will not be deterred should others not follow suit. We will not go back on our word. We will continue, but we will protect our people and their livelihoods. And this is leading and protecting uh, that represent the external parameters of, of the package that I'll explain now. So what is the vision that's been um, our president, Ursula von der Leyen, that you see here, her slogan is, this is the EU's man on the moon moment. And uh, this is a mission for us as the European Union. That mission, we've, uh, to, we've also costed that to, and compared it to putting man on the moon. It's 18 times the cost uh, putting man on the moon, the decarbonizing the European Union. And you think, if you think about decarbonizing the planet, it's 459, I can't 59 times that. It's a lot of money. But at the same time, we've seen through the pandemic that when there was an existential challenge, finance was mobilized. So there's no reason why it can't be mobilized for uh, another existential challenge, one that can't be cured by the vaccine, by the way. What do we have? We have already set in stone the constitutional climate law, a bit like New Zealand, but a bit more strict in a sense that that climate law uh, commits us to go to zero in 2050 to be net negative after that. And also asks that our member states develop emissions reduction plans over decades, rolling decades in a 30 year framing and consulting with levels below. So if you're a federal government, you need to consult with your states and your cities. If you're centralized, you still got regions and cities. So that uh, from the bottom up, but top down, everyone agrees of where investments need to be made and uh, what uh, is required from everyone. We had, our goal is quite stringent because it's a 55 emissions reduction goal, but it's also domestic. So there's no, it's all on EU territory. We're not going to buy emissions reductions offshore. Also, we are not having an open-ended uh, possibility to buy offsets to forestry or to account for our removals for forestry. We want to focus on emissions reduction, not banking on nature to bail us out. Also because our nature is not doing so well in Europe, it's suffering from climate impacts. We just, we just can't uh, count on that too much. Also, we are galvanizing ambitious climate finance it's part of the COVID green stimulus is five, around 5 trillion New Zealand dollars. That's only EU at EU level that comes on top of the national level. And we've put some green strings in there so that there is not, perhaps not everything is entirely climate focused, but everything does no harm to the climate objective. So how do we go to, uh, do we plan to go to net zero? We've got four main um, principles. The first one is energy efficiency first, of course, the cleanest and the cheapest energy is the one that you don't use. And making sure we are very reasonable with energy also lowers the transition cost for everyone else. So that's the first thing. Second is yes, switching to renewables, but it's not the only thing that there is about renewables. You also need to rethink your all energy system because it's going to be decentralized. It's going to be with two-way flows of energy. It's going to be with demand response of people deciding not to consume now to consume later. It's going to be with storage. It's going to be with virtual power plants. So there's a lot of investments needed into that digitalization and that smartness of the energy system. Then we're going to use the circular economy system, in particular to reduce emissions in the industrial sector or in manufacturing. You have to get rid of the system where you emit at the mining stage and then the, at the manufacturing stage and then the waste stage. It just makes no sense. We have a value destruction model so much that at the end of the life of a product, you sometimes we have to use taxpayers' money to, to get it back and to, to handle it. We need to go to a system that preserves value so that materials can be recuperated in another economic cycle. 
And that means we won't have to emit again for mining and for, for producing the material in the first place. So that's the whole system that we're putting in place. And then we have to factor in scarcity of space like never before in the European Union, or maybe some countries like the Netherlands have already had to. But um, as in the EU as a whole, if we want to feed people with reduced areas suitable for farming, if we want to uh, have, we need more land for energy production, we need more, more lands for probably offsetting our emissions in the end, so especially the hard to abate one. And we need room for biodiversity and for ourselves. So we need to start making collective decisions about what, how we allocate land in a way that has never been done before. What does it mean in terms of sectors? Um, we feel we can get sectors close to zero for electricity, buildings, waste, land, and transport. So that are those that are diminishing above that red line. Uh, they're diminishing or vanishing. And then you've got those that we can't get to zero. Uh, aviation and shipping, not necessarily because of a technological problem, but because in the European Union, we won't be able to decide what type of plane will land or what type of ship will come necessarily. And we will still have to reduce these emissions at least for half of their international journey. That's our vision. And so we can't take responsibility for all of that. Um, for agriculture, it's difficult to completely re-engineer a cow. And for some industrial sectors, it is difficult to completely re-engineer cement manufacturing, in particular in other sectors. Um, it's just the, it's not the energy that is used for these industrial, it's just the process uh, of creating these materials. So we will need sinks, but we don't want to use the sinks, the forestry for the sectors that can go to zero. We want to make sure we use these things for the hard uh, to abate sectors. And that's the whole vision of how we can uh, be rational in going to uh, zero. So we have got three types of sectors and um, we organize them into pillars. So the first pillar is uh, the, the one that's in the middle, industry, electricity, aviation, maritime, all of these sectors, they operate across borders in the European Union and um, they have one market basically. We use one tool, the EU ETS. And our plan is to strengthen the EU ETS to have three times more emissions reductions that we had so far in the EU ETS. So minus 61%. Then we've got the middle pillar. These sectors, we have EU standards for them. We have EU standards for cars, and that's land transport. We have EU standards for buildings. We have EU standards for waste management and for agriculture. But still, we cannot, at Brussels, in Brussels, decide on the urban form, decide on the actual farming system in every corner of the EU, just that doesn't work. So what we do is that on top of these standards, we uh, agree an effort sharing. The effort sharing allocates a share of that target of minus 40% for 2030 between the 27 member states according to their GDP. So there is a solidarity system in there. Germany, for example, and Scandinavian countries have to decrease emissions in these sectors by 50% uh, by 2030, whereas Bulgaria has to only do minus 10%. So that's, you know, uh, we get the, the gist of it. Then we have the land sector on the right hand side. And the, in the land sector, so far, we, I had none applicable because we had no particular target um, until now. But we're creating one for 2030 where we want to create a sink of around 310 million tons. This represents about 15% more than we currently have. Our sink has been decreasing by 20% in the last 10 years due to wildfires, pests and disease, and generally uh, dryness and our forests are really suffering, particularly in Central Europe. So going back up to 310 million tons, back up 15% is already hard, but it, it is a regenerating uh, aspect and that we want we have this target for 2030, it's allocated by member state according to what they can do, their forests, etc. The interesting thing for New Zealand is that we're going to switch agriculture from the middle pillar to the land pillar in 20, uh, so that we reach neutrality within the land pillar and agriculture in 2035. So in effect, we want to compensate the remaining emissions in agriculture by 2035 entirely with our new regenerated sink. After that, that pillar has to go towards creating more removals to help with industry and the rest. So the basket of measures, um, don't worry, don't, don't be frightened, there are 13, um, but I will not go through all of them, I'll just say a few words about each of them, and I will start by explaining the logic of them. So the first logic is the, we've got the pricing pillar 
it's polluter pays principle for us. It's a constitutional principle in our treaty. Uh, nothing special about that. We have the targets pillar. So economists don't like that because it could be inefficient to have targets on top of pricing. Right? Still, we have targets because there are non-market barriers. And for example, split incentives. If you own a building, well, if you invest in energy efficiency, but you're renting that, of course, the rent and the owner, they don't have the same incentives. And so that's one non-market barrier we can help resolve with a target. We also use targets because we need to create a package that is a politically palatable for our 27 member states. Some are super interested in, industri in industrial policy, so they will like a renewable target. Some are very interested in creating jobs. They'd be super interested in the energy efficiency. Efficiency target creates lots of jobs. Uh, and so that allows us also to say something more that don't worry, we going to have a great climate policy it's all about taxes and ETSs because that's not very appealing and that doesn't capture anyone's imagination but if you say we are going to reach that percentage of renewables and create that amount of jobs in energy efficiency it helps so targets are useful on all sorts of uh, for all sorts of reasons and then we've got rules rules are uh, we use to send the clearest possible signal to industry as to what will be the acceptable solutions on our market for example, the revised CO2 standards for car and vans legislation, we've said there will be no more conventional cars and vans put on EU market after 2035. We didn't pick that date, which is a bit late, according to some of what our members want to do. But the logic is a car or a van on EU market stays for 15 years. If in 2050 we want to have no more of these cars, the last ones have to come in 2035. So that sends a very a uh, clear message to the automotive industry in Europe and abroad. And then the last type of um, measures are funds. Our funds are fed through revenues from pricing and they help transition different types of actors um, towards net zero outcome. So I'll, I'll just say a few words now about some of the, in particular the ones that have been mentioned in the press. Um, so in the EU ETS, the first thing, what we're doing is that we're integrating maritime emissions for the first time, including half of the international legs. So a ship, a container ship that leaves New Zealand and enters into an EU port would have to pay for half of its emissions on the way, and vice versa. We're also removing free allocation for our industry. So far, we were uh, saying to our trade exposed industry, poor, poor you, we can't really submit you to all that um, pricing because of course then you would be disadvantaged on international markets. Problem with that, of course, there's no investments in lower, uh, low emissions technology and the prices of these technologies don't uh, decrease and it's all delayed. So we are going to stop that progressively, but we need to ensure that this doesn't just mean our emissions will be displaced elsewhere together with the jobs. That's why we're setting up the new carbon border adjustment mechanism that has been uh, referred to in the press as the EU carbon border tax. We can call it an adjustment mechanism. <laughs> and um, it's limited to six industrial sectors, um, iron, steel, aluminum, fertilizers, cement, and power. These sectors have been chosen because they're the most trade exposed and the most um, uh, intensive in terms of emissions. And in producers, importers of these products into the EU market will, will just have to pay an equivalent price according to the carbon content that is paid on the EU market, minus whatever they would have paid on their own market. So it's to create that level playing field, not, nothing more. And we are not leveling the playing field for Europeans on the, the world's markets. So they will have to compete having paid the full price. They will not be compensated at the board. We want investments to take place, low carbon investments. Uh, what else has been discussed? Um, the new social climate fund. So there is this spectre of the gilets jaunes, of the yellow vests movement um, in France, that uh, social unrest that ha happened after President Macron tried to increase uh, fuel tax. We, of course, that's the worry, because we are creating this separate ETS for road transport and building fuel suppliers. We need to create that new ETS because at the moment, the replacement rate, the refurbishment rate for buildings is only 1% a year. So only 1% of buildings are renovated towards negative energy, towards uh, no near zero energy building standards each year. 
and 75% of the buildings that will stand in 2050 are already there. So we've got to accelerate the replacement rate and um, that tool will help because it will put a, increase the, the, the price, of course, of um, using a lot of uh, fossil fuel energy for your building. And similarly, we need to do that for transport because even though we have cleaner and cleaner cars, we have got all this stock of cars and we need to accelerate the natural replacement rate. And that's what the ETS will do. But of course, the risk is that it will have a regressive um, social impact on the most vulnerable. And so we need to ensure that no one is left behind. So what we're doing is that we're rechanneling um, the funds from that ETS into the new social climate fund. And we're also setting up that fund one year ahead of the creation of the ETS as a smart accounting trick here to make sure we get the money before we <laughs> levy the, it's just using budget in, in, in the meantime. And one year ahead, um, we will uh, ensure that those that are at risk of energy poverty, and we've got around 50 million people in the EU, I think problems paying the uh, utility bills already. And those that are at risk of mobility poverty, a less defined concept that, that we are going to work hard to identify those at mobility poverty, will be given alternatives or be given direct in income support until they are leapfrogged to a, a situation where they have access to low carbon transport and they don't need energy or at least not a lot of energy to heat and cool themselves. So the, some of the financing schemes that are put forward are, you may have heard of energy performance contracting. It's a system whereby a company says to a multi-dweller, particularly it works well for social housing, company says, I'm going to take care now of your energy bill for the next three years. And I'm going to remunerate myself on the, on the I will invest in energy efficiency and I'll get my profit from the difference between the bill that I'm going to now, that it will reduce and I will pay, and the fact that, oh, you get what I mean, I'm getting. <laughs> so that's energy performance contracting is being used with social, social housing because it means that you don't have the upfront cost of renovating. You keep paying the same bill for a lot longer than if you had paid yourself for the energy efficiency improvement. So that's one scheme. Other schemes are zero interest rates for um, um, e-vehicles or sh shared vehicle systems for rural communities. Uh, of course, free public transport, et cetera, et cetera. That's a new social climate fund. I will not talk about the other ones. If you have questions later, I could. Um, so now I want to talk a little bit about the state of EU public uh, opinion as we table that in July. Uh, it's a high stakes sort of exercise for our politicians. So it's interesting to have a look. Of course, we've got no problem with scientists. We've got no issues with the financial sector either. Um, since Paris, the risk of investing in the wrong things is a financial risk that is recognized. So they're really fully behind. Courts and justice are fully behind. We've had quite a lot of climate litigation in the last years, and, and it's now recognized as lack of action is a human rights uh, problem, according to most EU courts now in Europe. Military and defense been telling us for a long time that it's a, it's a security imperative. Of course, the youth is mobilized and the press. There's been a, a shift in the way, in the knowledge, in the knowledge and understanding in the press uh, media in the last five years. They're really now able to confront um, politicians uh, when they say things that don't align with science. So it's, it's really interesting to have seen how the press has evolved. We've had this interesting poll in July showing that, you know, it seemed like, uh, oh, it's going to be easy. Over 90% of Europeans, you know, think we should be climate neutral, et cetera, et cetera. But then huh, when it comes to discussing the actual policy measures, it's more difficult. The concerns about the disruption, about the speed, it's not only businesses, it's, it's people. And, and we have to tackle that. And we've tried to tackle that in every aspect of our package to show we will leave no one behind and businesses will have time and finance, but there's no excuse. There will be no excuse for not taking action. You are going to lose out if you're not taking action as a business. So the transition has to be just, or there will be just no transition and be social unrest. So far we, as the European Union, we had develop the proof of concept for being able to grow your economy and decarbonize at the same time we have decoupled. But the new frontier, the new proof of concept is to decouple net zero policies from adverse social impact. 
and to be able to lead internationally while protecting our uh, economies and our workers and uh, against jobs leakage in particular. We want to also inspire others to follow suit. And we believe we, it's a, the EU experience at high stakes for the world's democracies and the planet because no one is trying to do what we're trying to do at the moment. Um, there's lots of talk. We haven't seen domestic policy measures by the big, the other big partners. Uh, so we're ready to cooperate with other jurisdictions. We've, we've sketched, we've tabled legislation and uh, we'd be happy to cooperate with others. What, um, how, what else can we do to inspire others? We only represent 8% of the world's emissions by now. We're not going to make it or break it by, by ourselves, but our consumption is still above. We can, we can do a lot through our consumption, in particular because we're a big market of relatively wealthy people, and so that counts internationally. We're the first climate finance donor and the first development finance donor, um, and it means that we also help reduce emissions worldwide. We have the largest R&DI program with uh, over 30% bonding focus on climate horizon Europe. It's open to researchers internationally and we hope that New Zealand will become a strategic partner for that. We also, the first, and that's not always well known, the first investor worldwide, the first exporter, the first importer. We've got the largest number of free trade agreements with the largest number of countries and with the number one trade partner for the most number of countries worldwide. Um, so that gives us through, through that uh, and, and the environmental parameters we put in our, on, in our trade deal, quite a lot of potential leverage and impact as well. We have uh, an interesting banking footprint, pension funds footprint, insurance, um, insurance companies, investments footprints that we're trying to leverage as well. And our corporates also have subsidiaries worldwide. And as we regulate them in the EU, we also regulate the subsidiaries and so that adds to what we can do um, in the EU. And then we've got our trophy graph that I mentioned already that we've decoupled, of course. But the, the next step for us is this. So I've already talked about the top left-hand side, we've got the ETS Maritime, the carbon border adjustment mechanism. I didn't talk about changing our definition of sustainable biomass. Big problem was that we were importing wood pellets in the EU to be fired in coal power stations, but now firing wood, except that these wood pellets were from whole trees that had been cut down for this, and this doesn't work. So now we're changing so that uh, we will not, people will not be able to um, market on EU mar market in the EU market those wood pellets. They will have to come from uh, waste streams from the forestry industry. Uh, circular economy, I mentioned a bit. So we, we, for an example, is our new battery legislation. The free table where we said uh, every new battery will have to have a carbon footprint declaration. And after three years, there's going to be a maximum climate carbon footprint for you to be able to market the battery into the EU market. We've also said we start with a declaration of recycled content. After three years, there's going to be a minimum recycled content before you can put the battery on the EU market. So trying to change the circular system through this and with textiles, it's going to be the same system, the recycled content, the maximum footprint. We're going to table legislation in the second half of this year. Then we're going to table the same for all manufactured products. And we're going to table also legislation on substantiating green claim. We did a suite of websites selling products on the EU market and 42% of them had uh, false green claims. At the moment, it's difficult for us to fight because you have to do a case by case uh, thing each time um, and, and it's just not. So we will legislate so that there is compulsory substantiation of your green claim against a joint a common framework and a set of fines that don't require, that can be quite automatic, that don't require too much legis legal uh, judicial effort. Um, then we've got the clean energy. We're still, we're still the first oil and gas importer. Uh, we will get out of that, of course, but while we're still the first oil and gas importer, it means that we can also legislate so that we ensure that the pipelines uh, are not leaking. Um, we've got our satellites, so we would table uh, our legislation the second half of this year to, to force the repair uh, of the leaky pipelines on, for the gas and the oil that we buy. Then we've got all the sustainable food system work. Um, the EU is apparently responsible for 16% of deforestation worldwide through our imports of palm oil, soybean, coffee, cocoa, wood, and one more. 
Hmm, it's going to come back. So we, need, we are going to legislate to ensure that there is due diligence for supply chains for these commodities into the EU market. The, the, so the rest is um, not necessarily entirely climate related pesticides is different. But the last one, sustainable food labeling framework. We're trying to make sure that EU consumers, when they'll buy food products, it's clear to them what is the footprint of the product, not only the climate footprint, but also the water footprint, the waste, the circular, is, is it a circular product, the biodiversity footprint, the air quality footprint. And we're working on all those metrics to ensure that it'd be this compulsory labeling for any product put, food product put on the EU market. That's working out the metrics takes a bit of time. So that's going to be tabled in 2024. And so to, to sum up, what are we trying to do? We're trying to lead by example. We're trying to use our diplomacy. That's why I'm here tonight. Our trade tools, our development cooperation um, to inspire. But we also can set standards and use what is called the Brussels effect, the standardization of products through the appeal of our market, uh, changing ways products are designed worldwide. But, um, you know, it's not something Climate change is not something the team of 450 million can deliver. It's just something only the team of 8 billion can deliver. And um, so we are really calling on men and women worldwide to act in unison, to be the first to deliver peaceful, coordinated, accelerated civilization change. We think we have a model but um, like Hamlet, we know we will end up in history. We just don't know what the history book will say. This is on us. Wonderful, uh, fantastic. Um, one of the things I meant to say in the introduction is that the EU has decoupled growth from, from emissions, and it was very evident in, in the, one of your first few slides. So, um, yeah, it's fantastic. It's great to see, especially in the context of New Zealand, where our emissions continue to rise. Um, okay, this is a, an exclusive group, so I'd be very surprised if they don't have uh, questions. So, questions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was just going to run the mic. <laughs> Thank you very much, Janet Stevenson here, and it was an excellent talk, and uh, I'm, I hope New Zealand um, takes some inspiration from the extensive um, action that the EU is taking. It's really awe-inspiring. Um, one thing that you've made very clear is the, is the absolute need to get your communities behind you, your, your everything from, from local stakeholders to businesses and, and everyone in between. What, what processes have you been imagining that are going to be followed to enable this to happen? I, I'm really interested in this because it's also an issue we're going to be facing in New Zealand as time comes. And um, yeah, any inspiration you can give us, I think will be very helpful. Yes, very good question. We've just launched something which we call the Climate Compact, uh, which is a, an initiative to encourage bottom-up action. Um, that is, is um, focused on um, ambassadors of change, agents of change, ambassadors for climate action, it can be um, you know, uh, accountants organizing themselves to change the way accounting is done. It can be doctors, it can be lawyers, it can be types of professions and, um, and making sure that um, the ambassador for that profession engages in discussion with us because we can do a lot by training, um, helping with the retraining, helping with talks, helping with pledges. So we also we have set up through the compact a, a pledge system where we encourage communities to come up with a pledge that they can register that we can monitor and that we can uh, also help promote towards if there's government, their region, wherever they come from. We look at any pledge that uh, looks substantial enough and we, we how to say, we uh, beautify it, we promote it, we, uh, 
we give support to the pledging uh, to the pledging people. We have all these networks for cities internationally as well. It's called the uh, the Global Covenant of Mayors, and it uh, is co-funded by the European Union and Bloomberg Philanthropies. We uh, have secretaries to help cities that pledge to go to zero and to resilience by a certain date that needs to be more ambitious or same as their jurisdiction state, NDC. And all the cities that sign up to that will have the support of a consultant that comes and helps the cities do their inventory of, of gases and the inventory, what are the risks for adaptation and guides them through the phases of planning to reduce emissions. So, so far this global covenant of mayors was mostly active in the EU, in Africa, in the North Asia, because we were paying for that with EU money and Bloomberg was paying for the whole American continent. And there was this uh, bit of a gap in the Asia Pacific. There, we, we will solve that this year. We're creating a secretariat. It's going to be one person based in New Zealand uh, with a team, I mean, one head of office. We'll see how big with the team to help New Zealand cities. There's already 10 New Zealand cities that are part of the global continent of mayors, but they haven't had a lot of support so far. So finally, they will have support. So uh, making sure that we help, that we give capacity and we help local actors at level is, is very important because there's only so much that you can do in particularly about the urban form top down it has to be a community discussion about you know bikes blocking off trees the, st the streets etc that can be difficult to have to handle that at community level uh, so that's one of the key things that, that we're doing um, yeah it would be a long conversation <laughs> but i hope i've conveyed some ideas <laughs> Thank you. And before we let uh, Ivan have the microphone and the laundry list of questions that he's got, um, there. Are, uh, if anyone on the Zoom has a question, uh, put that up on the chat. But um, perhaps uh, the people who are most invested in the future, our future leaders, uh, in terms of our students, may have a question. I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> no pressure. Here we go. Thank you. Um, very nice presentation, very insightful information, and I think it will be very helpful for our future research. I actually particularly I have two questions. One is um, I would like to know what specific action EU is taking in line with biodiversity protection. Um, second question is, um, as you mentioned that EU is one of the first uh, region committed for climate finance $100 billion goal. Still now we see a recent study published by ODI mentioned that there are few European countries still lag behind contributing less than 20% of their commitment. And as you were um, sailing your diplomacy to the New Zealand, New Zealand is also falling short to contribute to climate finance commitment. So what is your thought either EU uh, as a, uh, a regional uh, organization is doing anything for those countries who are not contributing to their commitment? Good questions. <laughs> On climate finance, so we've mobilized $25 billion and we've just announced 4 billion, 4 extra billion. So that makes us unconditionally the number one climate finance donor. The US just increased to $11 billion. Right. So there's not a real comparison. Um, now, I think when you were mentioning individual member states, it was probably the 0.7% GDP um, commitment for development finance, which is different from climate finance. Yes, some of our member states are not meeting the 0.7% of GDP for development finance. Um, yes, nothing we can do much about it because budgetary budgets are still the competence of our member states. Uh, but it's different. I mean, development finance is different from climate finance. Uh, there is this, um, there, are, there are a lot of discussion on whether it should be additional, climate finance should be additional to development finance or whether you can have finance that ticks box, both boxes. That discussion is getting, uh, uh, you know, um, is losing a bit of traction because what counts is uh, not only to, meet the $100 billion goal, and uh, we're not there. 
but with the new uh, the new US announcement, I think we may be around 90 billion, so we may be only 10 billion short. We have uh, six weeks to go. To, no, sorry, two two weeks to go to Glasgow. Mm -hmm. Don't know who's going to come up with the uh, with the missing money. On um, on biodiversity, we have a biodiversity strategy. The most um, maybe the most telling uh, targets are for New Zealand are, for example, our decision to set aside 10% of agricultural land out of production. Um, of course, there's 30% protection of our lands and, and oceans, but um, putting land out, out of agricultural production is, is, I think, the most iconic thing that we've tabled on the biodiversity. Our taxonomy for um, we have, it's a, it's a bit long to explain, but we have a system to define what is a green activity, which we call a taxonomy. And we have, what a green activity is also defined according to its biodiversity impact. So it's, it's one crucial area of defining green, just as climate is, just as air quality is, water management is. Yeah, two answers. Okay, thank you, Iftikhar. Uh, thank you, Richard. So I see we've got some questions online. Um, so what is the timeline for cutting out fossil fuel subsidies in the EU? We have a, a commitment to um, go to put our fossil fuel subsidy to zero. I have to say, as I explained before, budget is not the competence of the European Union. We can't decide on what our member states, what they want to do with their budget. What we can do, however, is uh, make sure we have no fossil fuel subsidies through the EU budget, which we've done. One of the measures that I've not commented in the package is we'll remove fossil fuel subsidies, around 40 billion fossil fuel subsidies. It is the revision of our energy taxation directive. We had lots of trouble modifying this while Britain was a member because you we need unanimity to modify that legislation. And Britain was not wanting to us to do anything to do with taxation, we couldn't modify it. And unfortunately, that legislation had exemptions for fishing, for agriculture, for maritime, and for planes. What we've just tabled uh, on the 14th of July is ending these exemptions and is increasing the rates. So if this is adopted unanimously, we will remove around 40 billion fossil fuel subsidies in the EU in terms of not subjecting these activities to tax whereas they should be taxed like any other uh, activity. Cool. Wonderful. Any more questions from here? Right. Thank you so much. Uh, I just, it's interesting to see the relevance or the importance of legislation, this whole uh, urgent uh, process which where ne legislation is needed to drive it, regulatory forcing legislation, is within the uh, European Union, is it going to be left mainly to the current uh, structure, regime with the European Court sort of enforcing this legislation or are you, is Europe going to set up a specialist climate court arrangement when it comes to this matter. Yeah. The question is the normal court arrangement. And uh, we've already had fines. <laughs> some of our member states would have been late with some of the legislation have been fined. So we've got the system that works that ensures that our legislation is enforced. But actually with the climate legislation, we haven't had, uh, we've got 20 years experience now, we haven't had a lot of problem. In fact, we have tended to overachieve all the time. That is due to the fact that the EU system sets a minimum level of ambition for each member state, but some of them are have national targets that are beyond. For example, Finland wants to be the first climate neutral country in 2035. But our idea is that we don't want Finland's ambition to uh, automatically reduce the ambition of the others. So that's why we set these minimum standards for everyone. And then our member states can nationally you know, decide to even go above. And then we and then we overachieve. And so so um, there's been not a lot of litigation inside the EU about uh, our legislation. Yeah, Here? yes. Um, thank you. I really appreciate your presentation um, in terms of the basket of measures. I can see 
really see the rigorous effort into it. So just a question concerning you know, one of the pillars, especially the pricing pillar. So um, uh, lately, I know that Australia, they're actually in the procure, uh, procurement process to set up a carbon, uh, carbon exchange. So I'll, I'm not sure what the, what's your um, what's your view toward that? Is um, I haven't read about uh, Australia's plan for a carbon exchange. Oh, okay. Sorry. Oh, um, I, yeah. I've lived in Australia and I've, I've looked at the system, but they they have an indirect carbon price rather than a, and then there's then a, there's no ETS, so it's it's very Correct. indirect. Mm -hmm. so I wonder what they have in mind. Um, yes, if you can explain a bit. Yes. Yeah, so I th they actually just. Um, Lately this year, they started a procurement to, uh, they're trying to thinking in the process of probably in two or three year timeline to set up a carbon exchange. Well, they claim it to, it will be like the first um, in the world to do this. So I was just wondering EU as, you know, the first EU ET, the ETS, um, whether, what's your view toward this, such an innovation? Yeah, I would need to read about it to be able to comment on it. I don't really understand what it would be, what okay. how it would be set up, what would happen on that exchange. Uh, sorry, I, I fear it, it, it would be about removals um, rather than, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. I understand. Well, it's yeah, it's good if there are innovations. We are always interested in innovations because we can learn from them. I wish them success. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Wonderful. I think it's. Um, I guess we should keep to time and. Um, I know my, my tummy's rumbling, so um, I'd just like to uh, hand over to Sarah to, to uh, wrap up and, and say our thanks. Uh, but from uh, my perspective, thank you very much. Kia ora, um, Carolyn, and thank you so much. I feel like we're just on the brink of something with this, which for many of us in this room have been waiting for for quite some time. So I've really enjoyed hearing that and um, just so much. It feels so overwhelming. And I really look forward to seeing the leadership from the EU, and I really hope that trickles down into Aotearoa. But so kia ora, and thank you very much. Notice that uh, I'm at risk of falling, so <laughs> just <laughs> my laces. Thank you so much. Thank you um, very much for inviting me. Just make sure yes. we'll take the microphone. And I guess the obvious question is. <laughs> I think it's.